So without further delay, uh, I'm pleased to announce the, the first paper uh, of the symposium uh, titled Tax Deficits and the Income Shifting of U.S. Multinationals. Uh, the authors are Scott Dyring, Robert Hills, uh, and Kevin Markle. Uh, Scott will present, uh, and then Johannes Vogt of the University of Mannheim will discuss. Uh, so Scott, you have uh, 20 minutes, and Johannes, you will have uh, 10 minutes uh, once Scott is done. All right, so Scott, you can take it away. Go ahead and share screen. All right, thanks a lot, Pete. Um, that should be showing up. I hope it is. And um, let me uh, thank uh, first the conference organizers for the opportunity to present. Um, it's, it's really a, a privilege and, and I'm probably like many of the others from North America, it would have been amazing to go to Norway. So hopefully um, the opportunity will arise sometime in the future where we can uh, gather in person uh, again. Um, so this is a very early paper, uh, sort of in an area that I've been playing around with for a while, but um, Robert Hills and Kevin Markle are my excellent co-authors. And um, I'm really looking forward to feedback because of the sort of kind of newness of, of what we're doing here. Um, so in, in an audience like this, I don't have to spend very much time motivating the paper, but as you know, if you've been watching the news, um, international taxes in the headlines like all the time, uh, the most recent one I saw was that Switzerland plans to use subsidies to offset the uh, the G7 tax regime. So it's sort of an interesting game of cat and mouse where um, we try to cooperate, but then there's always a defector and um, I'm not sure if it will ever end, but um, it's, it's fun to uh, at least think about. Um, so there's many reasons that there's controversy, but in at some level, one of the controversies is about revenue loss. And um, it's alleged that there's massive amounts of revenue that is lost. Uh, government, governments are losing out on you know, billions of dollars of tax revenue. And this is a problem for many reasons. Um, but one question that could be raised is how much revenue is lost. And I think that's an important question because if the revenue loss is kind of relatively small, maybe the policy response would be much different than if the revenue loss is very big. So how much revenue is lost? Well, there's lots of estimates, but some of the most recent estimates using macroeconomic data by say, for example, Kim Klossing or Gabriel Zuckman are suggesting really big numbers, like for example, 100 billion of US tax revenue lost to income shifting by US multinationals like per year, roughly. Um, and then Wright and Zuckman and others have, have essentially argued that somewhere in the neighborhood of 50% of the income of multinational companies, the foreign income of multinational companies, ends up being captured in tax havens. Um, but these magnitudes are disputed. And Jennifer Bloom, who's here and will be on a panel later, has a, a recent paper that is arguing because of certain accounting issues in the underlying data that is used by some of the macro studies the estimates can be significantly overstated. And um, so it seems like this is an important area of uh, debate in the literature right now. Um, one of the fascinating things about this is if you go to the um, OECD and, and look up the base erosion and profit shifting frequently asked questions, one of them is how much, how much revenue is lost? And one of my favorite little statements is at the very bottom there, but the existing data and studies do not provide enough information to reach solid conclusions about how much BEPS actually occurs. Which is kind of an amazing uh, statement given that these are the bodies that are making recommendations for policies and they're often followed. Um, so um, I don't think I have to spend too much time convincing you that firms are operating in tax havens and so forth. Um, but uh, in, in our sample, these are US multinational firms. Um, what we're gonna see is um, that over time, the number of firms that have disclosed a significant subsidiary in a tax haven um, is increasing. And I don't think that's probably a great surprise to most people, but it's just sort of a, a way to illustrate that this is kind of an important area. Um, and actually, let me back up just a little bit. I think I may have skipped a slide here. I'm not exactly sure how to find that slide here. No, not there. Oh, maybe I didn't skip a slide. Yeah, we're good. Okay, sorry about that. 
Um, here's another way of looking at similar data. So what I'm doing here is I'm gathering data from Exhibit 21, which is a required disclosure by US multinational firms. And the firms are re required in theory to disclose a list of the countries and the names of their significant subsidiaries. So that's, that's where this data came from. And this is just another way of looking at the same data. Um, and what you see here is firms are becoming more multinational. They're operating in more countries. They're operating in more tax haven countries. Fewer and fewer companies disclose no foreign subsidiaries at all over time. And the growth seems to be at some level driven by increases in operations in low tax countries. Um, then the last thing I would just say, and this is gonna turn out to be somewhat important for thinking about magnitudes. Um, if you take US companies, US companies in addition to being required to disclose the location of their foreign or really all of their subsidiaries that are significant are also um, required to uh, uh, separate their foreign, their, their earnings into pre-tax domestic earnings and pre-tax foreign earnings. And, and likewise, their tax expense is separated into uh, foreign and domestic components. So what one can do then is just aggregate over time um, or, or any given year or in any way you desire the um, foreign earnings of US multinational firms. Now this would be like kind of like a consolidated foreign earnings. And essentially it treats the world as two locations, US and everything else. And that has disadvantages, but it also has some advantages in the sense that um, the, one of the issues raised in prior research is that there can be double counting of income depending on how the accounting um, is done from one subsidiary to the next. And that's not going to be a problem um, with uh, our data. And the reason there's three lines here is depending on the tests we run, we have to restrict the sample for certain types of firms. But as you can see, it doesn't affect the aggregate amount of foreign earnings very much. So say if we delete firms that um, are, you know, have very small assets or something like that, it, it really doesn't change uh, the total amount of earnings that we're talking about. So what are we trying to do in our study? Um, what we want to do is we want to use micro data to explore issues that sort of arise in macro data related to two issues. The, the thing I'm probably gonna focus on most today is weighting. Um, macroeconomic data is implicitly weighted often by some measure of firm size. And then there's the double counting issue, which uh, I talked about a minute ago. We wanna take this micro data and sort of examine um, the estimates of income shifting, tax revenue loss, and et cetera, with this micro data and compare it to what's happening with the macro data and then provide new estimates um, using this data. And, and then the advantage to using micro data is we can drill down into the data and we can provide lists of firms or we can look at industries or we can separate firms by size or whatever we want to do because we're not constrained uh, by the aggregation that's inherent in the macroeconomic data. So I'm gonna be fairly quick because I don't have much time, but I'm just gonna show you mostly a bunch of figures and charts, and hopefully this will illustrate the point. I wanna start by talking about a paper by Wright and Zuckman. And essentially what Wright and Zuckman do is they show that the foreign effective tax rate calculated at the macro level, so total foreign taxes divided by total foreign income, that that rate is declining over time. And that's the top figure uh, on the right. And I've highlighted the area from 2000 to 2015 in yellow because that's the time period that they focused on to draw certain conclusions. And I'll show you how we replicate that in a minute. And then on the bottom, they use the same data to estimate the fraction of income that's recorded by US multinationals in tax havens. And that's the bottom uh, figure. And the yellow highlighted portion is a portion that we'll replicate in a few minutes using our micro data, but they estimate that by 2015, about 50% of the income of multinationals, US multinationals was recorded in tax havens. Um, when analyzing this 15 percentage point drop in effective tax rate from 2000 to 2015, Wright and Zuckman essentially 
make the following argument. Uh, the statutory tax rate declined by seven percentage points. So that's accounting for a whole bunch of it. Um, or sorry, yeah, by seven percentage points. And then the rest is basically caused by income being moved to tax havens, either because real activities are moved to tax havens or basically paper income shifting to tax havens. And so we'll discuss that uh, in just a minute. The first thing we're going to do here is just replicate this trend in effective tax rates uh, by taking CompuStat data and ag creating a macro version of effective tax rate. And you can see the dark line is uh, the what Wright and Zuckman have, and the gray line is our replication using CompuStat data. And they don't, they're not a perfect match, but they're close enough that one feels like at least you're capturing something in the ballpark. Um, and, and it's a pretty easy thing to replicate. And in fact, there's other things in their paper that one can replicate with this data, and they are very close matches. Um, so when you think about this, one thing to consider is weighting. And when you think about a foreign ETR as computed by Wright and Zuckman, it's a weighted average uh, effective tax rate where the weight is essentially the pre-tax foreign income of the firm. So what that means is like the really big foreign companies, Apple and Google and others, will have a much bigger influence on that trend than some small company like Avon or somebody like that. Um, and then the other thing to think about with regard to the conclusions that are drawn by Wright and Zuckman is that they basically assume that that trend is driven by two things, the change in statutory tax rate and moving more income to tax havens. But of course, it could be driven by other things. Um, there could be tax holidays. We know there's patent boxes. There's a whole list of things that have caused the tax rates of companies to move, which are not necessarily related to the statutory tax rate in any given country. Okay, so just to think about weighting, one simple thing that we can do because we have micro data is we can split our sample into groups based on the size of earnings that the company reports. So we did this using quartiles, but we could use any other thing. And what you can see is the firms in the highest quartile of earnings have a much steeper decline in their aggregate foreign effective tax rate than do say the firms in the lowest quartile. And in fact, if you look at the yellow period, which is the period highlighted by Wright and Zuckman, the um, lowest quartile doesn't have any change at all in their foreign effective tax rate. And this is kind of interesting because if you want to argue that income shifting is pervasive, um, what this is suggesting is it doesn't appear to be so pervasive. It might be, uh, at, at least based on the way Wright and Zuckman uh, estimate things. And it, it's certainly possible that there's some big firms that are shifting a lot of income or routing those dollars to havens, but the aggregate amount is, is relatively uh, across all firms, it's big numbers, but the typical firm may not be doing anything at all, at least using their methodology. They also argue that effective tax rates are driving this decline, but with microdata, one can just check to see, does the tax rate change with the, the statutory tax rate? So the effective tax rate as a function of the statutory tax rate, and that's this is a regression that runs that that model. So the dependent variable is your effective tax rate. The independent variable is the statutory tax rate. And then there's some other factors here. And I guess one way to look at this, and this will be no surprise to those of you who have studied effective tax rates, it's really hard to explain the variation in effective tax rates. And statutory tax rates don't do a very good job of explaining them. So if one wants, wants to make the claim that uh, income, in a, income tax rates are driven by statutory tax rates, it's true. That's Part, that's a partial explanation, but it's only a very small fraction of the variation in effective tax rates. Um, and then finally, um, Wright and Zuckman use sort of a very simple approach to estimate how much of this tax is in um, tax havens. And we can do a similar thing firm by firm. And what we do here is we say, okay, um, let's suppose that a firm could have location in two places, high tax countries and low tax countries. We know how much foreign earnings you have. We know what the tax rates are in the non-tax haven countries where you have significant 
subsidiaries. We know what the tax rates are in the tax havens where you operate. And so we can use that to estimate the um, fraction of earnings that are in a haven versus a non-haven. Uh, the top line in this figure is the Wright and Zuckman percentage. And the bottom line um, is the mean of this X number, which I've shown you how to calculate for our sample. It's much lower. You could also um, kind of aggregate, or in other words, weight by earnings in the similar way that Wright and Zuckman would be doing. And that's the middle line in our data. And I, and I think the point here would be to say that when looking at this data firm by firm, it's really hard to get the estimates that are as big as Wright and Zuckman can, uh, find, okay? Um, so who are the firms with the most uh, foreign earnings and tax havens? You can use the same data to just look at the firms. And it's all like the list of who you might expect to see in the newspaper, Apple, you know, Microsoft, Pfizer, a bunch of pharma firms and, and so forth. Um, and maybe this isn't too surprising, but I think it does sort of raise the issue. Are these estimates that are shown in prior research being driven by just a few really big firms? Or is this like a pervasive thing that's happening firm by firm? All right, just checking my time. Pete, do I go till 825, 830? 27, because we started at 807, you have five minutes. Oh, okay, thanks. Um, all right, so kind of key takeaways with regard to Wright and Zuckman. Um, foreign ETRs are weighted. The weight is foreign income. Um, there's a lot of firms out there that haven't experienced significant declines, and but, but there are a few firms that have a lot of income and tax havens, and they're very big firms. So one thing that one might, one conclusion one might draw is that if one is to uh, recommend policy prescriptions, it might make more sense to target those po policy prescriptions to these very large firms as opposed to broad-based policy prescriptions for a bunch of firms that aren't actually really a big part of the problem. Okay, I'm gonna move quickly through another issue, which is how much US revenue is lost. And this is kind of a different issue because now we're talking about shifting out of the US into some foreign country. And Clossing has some studies that suggest that this is a really big number, about 100 billion a year. One way to sort of calibrate this just to start off with, with micro data is to say, well, there's 450 billion in earnings in 2016. If all of those earnings were shifted out of the US, how much revenue would be lost? It'd be about 157 billion, which obviously it's absurd to assume that 100% of earnings are moved out. And yet we're not that far over Clossing's estimates. So that's like one way to calibrate. The second thing to think about is Clossing runs basically a simple regression. Log of foreign earnings at the macro level is a function of a country's GDP plus its tax rate. We can kind of do the same thing at a firm level. We can take the log of your foreign earnings and we can estimate it as a function of the tax rate that the firm faces. Every firm facing a slightly different rate because it operates in different countries and those countries changing their rates over time. You get an elasticity or semi-elasticity on the tax rate. You use that elasticity to estimate how much income has been shifted. Clossing does it country by country. We do it firm by firm. Um, when we estimate these elasticities, one of the sort of surprising things that comes out of these simple regressions is that the elasticities are pretty big. And that's been a criticism of micro data, that the elasticities in the micro data are too small. And what we've estimated here are kind of in the ballpark of what Clossing is estimating. I think it's because we've used a different method, but, but they're in the same vicinity, okay? Um, so if you then take our estimates and aggregate firm by firm and add up the total amount, you get something like this. Um, in 2017, $110 billion was shifted out. If you use 30% as the amount of revenue lost, which is probably an overestimate because some of those dollars were probably paid to countries in foreign taxes, but use that number, that's what Clostin uses. That would, that would suggest about 33 billion of lost revenue. So like a third roughly of the Clossing estimates. Um, so this obviously is sensitive to the elasticity that is calculated and Clossing uses an estimate that's a little bit lower than ours. The one that we use, ours is 3.286. If the estimate got really, really big, the amount of income shifted would be obviously much bigger, but just go to an extreme there and use something like eight at 
at an elasticity of eight, you have 180 billion shifted out, multiply that by 0.3, it's like 60 billion of revenue loss, which is still like lower than the Clossing estimate. Um, all right, where's the income shifting coming from? Computers, uh, pharma, electrical equipment, I think actually Apple's uh, classified as electrical, electrical equipment, so that's where that's coming from. Who are the firms? Same firms I just showed you, Apple, Microsoft, et cetera. All right. Um, okay. Um, key takeaway. Um, the BEA data, if you read Jennifer's paper, is probably double counting income. And that double counting is disproportionately arising in tax havens. If you redo the clossing stuff on microdata where we know there's no double counting, um, you're going to end up with lower estimates. And why does this happen? It could be because of the double counting, probably. And it could possibly also be because of the way the weighting works. Essentially, when you run a macro regression, you're running a weighted regression where the firms that are, that are biggest get the most weight. Um, all right, so uh, this was a quick summary of our paper, which basically we're trying to sanity check these macro estimates. The advantage to the micro data is you can disaggregate in useful ways, we believe. We sort of show in the paper that a small number of firm account for most of the income shifted. And it gives us sort of something to think about as policymakers. Do we want broad-based policies or do we want to somehow target specific types of firms or industries in those policies to uh, eliminate the possible side effects that come with uh, constraining policies? All right, thank you very much. I'll try to stop my share here and if I can figure out where to do that. And someone and, can take. Yeah, thanks, Scott. So next we have Johannes Fogut. He will be discussing your paper. All right, I see the slides. Okay, so Johannes, you have 10 minutes. I think you're on mute. I'm not sure if you're. There yes, you perfect. Yes. Well, thanks for uh, having me discuss this paper, which uh, I enjoyed greatly, gave me lots of new knowledge and lots of food for thought. Um, let's see how I can, there we go. So let me start with how this fits into the literature to show you what this contributes. So the previous work here has, employed either macro data or Bureau of Economic Analysis data. So there are basically three POI papers, which this paper uses sort of for friction and for contrasting, and that's the Wright and Sackman paper 2018, Clausing 2020, and the Blue and Robinson 2020 paper, which points out the big double counting issue in, uh, in the BEA data and saying that the profit shifting uh, may be largely overestimated in some of the previous work. So this paper says, you know what, we have this great data from CompuStat and the SEC filings, and we can con contribute stuff that prior work cannot. So it's micro level data, it's more granular. And so the big advantage that is currently pushed in the paper is, you know, we can look into heterogeneity. I think that's the main push of the paper currently. Um, I have a similar paper where we do micro-based estimates on something where aggregate evidence already exists. Two more points you could push. I'm not saying it is the superior way, maybe heterogeneity is the way to go. I think it's a really important point. Could be that it's you, you can get closer to causal inference compared to macro data. Uh, you may have more power because macro is always a bit anecdotal, right? Whereas with microdata, you may be able to come up with predictions with a lot more power. Um, and there's also literature that it may be superior if you use it for simulation. So these could be additional points that could be pushed in the paper. I'm not saying they should, but uh, just as an uh, opportunity. There are two cons here. Uh, one downside of this data is there's only one aggregate foreign earnings item per firm year. So my basic thought was that probably implies that the comparative advantage of this data approach or anything you do with this is that 
you can probably use it a lot better for you as outbound profit shifting and not so much for shifting between third countries outside of the US because you have to make a lot stronger assumptions for the shifting between countries uh, that are non-US. Um, that, that is one intuition I had. Uh, the other downside, which I'm not sure is such a big downside, is that it's only listed firms. Uh, but since listed firms are really the most important firms in the US, uh, well, I, actually, I don't know. Uh, but probably they, yeah, they're representative. So uh, here's my summary of the findings. And uh, I hope Scott is not uh, baffled afterwards. Uh, because my reading was sometimes a bit different, in particular when we get to the clausing estimates. But basically, this paper says, you know, Wright and Sackman, 2018, they get it largely right. The foreign effective tax rate declines a lot. But here comes the point of the paper. It's, it's just a few bad apples, which explain most of the patterns in the aggregate. And yeah, so representative for that, I, I picked figure five, where the gray line is based on um, simulations based on the microdata. If you just add everything up, oh no, uh, yeah, uh, then you get a pattern which is really, which follows very closely the macrodata, which is basically the black line. Um, so, in aggregate, the pattern, it doesn't really matter if you use the macrodata or the microdata, the, the, it, it, it really even has the same sort of time series uh, uh, pattern to it. Um, and here's the picture that says it's just a few bad apples. Um, that's figure six, where you see that the low foreign earnings, that's the top line here, is, well, a slight downward trend in the foreign effective tax rate, but it stays close to 35%. And then the high foreign income earners, uh, they are the ones for which you have this strong decline in the foreign effective tax rate. So. The question is, is that really such a bad thing? Is aggregation or is weighting by size a bug or a feature? And that, of course, depends on the policy question, right? It basically, are we either interested in the typical or the median firm? I'm, I'm really avoiding the word average here. Um, then, I mean, this is a really, this is really important. Uh, in my, and, and I think it's a really important point to, 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 to make, and it hasn't been made in the literature yet. One of the easy explanations for why the microestimates always come in with a lower sensitivity and the aggregate estimates with a much larger sensitivity is heterogeneity in responses. And in the microestimates, we're all excited about power, but you know we're, we're just looking at the typical response of a firm. And in the aggregate, it's the large, few bad apples which count. And if they show a larger response as implied by this figure, uh, that there, there's no discrepancy between the two actually. And that's a really important point. Um, just to see if I'm in time. Um, yes, you have four minutes. Oh, okay, then I'm not in time. Uh, <laughs> there, there is some, question I have about figure six, if some of it may be due to construction of the sample, because if I read this right, the negative tax payment years are excluded. And so one may overstate the effective tax rates of the low foreign income quartile. Um, then I wondered if the quartile split is problematic because it may be endogenous. Um, because how much foreign pretax income you have is also a question of how much you have outbound shifting out of the US. And that could be seen as endogenous. That's more technical stuff. Uh, some additional um, distinctions you may be able to make with your microdata that macrodata cannot do. I was wondering if you can illustrate how much of the aggregate effect is due to the composition of the sample changing over time. Sort of Google and Amazon just making a much larger part of the economy. Um, and how much is due to firms changing their behavior over time? I think currently constant behavior is assumed for the complete sample period. Or another thing one could try is why do the 30 bad apples behave differently? The current answer I think is industry because you 
sort of look into which industries are mainly responsible. So it's sort of the business model digitalization. Okay, here is the summary of findings part two. My reading of the paper was that the order of profit shifting out of the US is actually pretty similar to clousing, in particular when you use the firm fixed effect specification. Uh, though, so even based on the microdata with your simulations, you actually come pretty close to the rather large estimates that Clausing had, at least that was my rating. Um, another point I would try to make is, I think could be really fruitful to look at the paper from the angle of measurement error. So what's the story about classic measurement error? It would be an attenuation bias. So if that is the case here, all the estimates are a lower bound and the problem may actually be larger. So, for example, the regression to investigate how effective tax rates relate to statutory tax rates, one has to form an average of all the foreign tax rates. And what is used here to, to so there's only one foreign earnings item. And so, so how do you mix all these foreign tax rates? And here, what is used is this great piece of information about how many subsidiaries do these firms have abroad. Um, and then there's, there's another regression that also has to do some weighting. So the question would, would be the ideal weighting. It would be pretext income in the absence of profit shifting. Prior work often relies on inputs, which would be labor capital to form these averages. Um, here it's the weighting by subsidiaries. So the question is, is this classic measurement error? Because the subsidiaries are just a proxy for pre-tax income. And so do we just have an attenuation bias or is it even some other type of measurement error. One intuition would be that one underweights large countries and overweights small countries. For example, if you need just one subsidiary per country, that would be the case. But you can come up with other kind of intuitions here. And yeah, I haven't fully thought everything through how the measurement error could go, but I think it's an important point to think about. Uh, this was just a great piece of information about these significant subsidiaries. It's in the paper and in the interest of time, I'm not going to read it out. Uh, for me, that was really because I always wondered, you know, can the firm decide on this? Well, what are the exact rules? Uh, yeah, in this paper, it's written out and I really thought this was great. So for the future, what's the takeaway from this? It's really important to distinguish between the average coefficient in microdata. Maybe we get all too excited about the average coefficient, which is sort of what the typical firm does, and the average response size, because the average response size scales with the size of the firm, or maybe also with a larger reaction in heterogeneous uh, context. And that matches more closely with the aggregate response. So what if we, in our microdata work, what are the methodological implications? Should we form size categories? If size is largely exogenous, should we work more with quantile regressions? Uh, one point which we are now aware of already is of course that we have to account for the loss-making firms facing very different incentives. The zero really matters here. So I think these are really important points that the paper makes uh, and that the paper implies for future work. Um, yeah. So I think I'm way over time, so I'll stop. Um, no, that, that's good. Th thank you, Johannes. Um, Scott, do you want to just take a minute or so to um, sure. share additional thoughts before we go? Yeah, into I mean, Johannes, thank you very much. I mean, I think your points are like like exactly on what we feel like we need to do. I'll just briefly mention a couple things. The the fact that we only have public firms, it turns out, is not a very big deal in the U.S. There's only a couple of very big multinational firms that are private, so I think we're okay on that dimension. You mentioned quantile regressions, and and I think maybe Jennifer mentioned in the uh, chat a nonlinear regression. We're we're working on that. I'm actually staring at a figure of the quantile regression on my computer right now, but it didn't make it into the paper in time. Um, so that is one advantage to microdata is we can look at heterogeneity in the elasticities, and then we can come up with sort of more tailored um, income shifting responses instead of like one elasticity for like every firm. Um, really, everything else you said, I think I completely agree with. Um, obviously, how close one gets to other estimates, you know, is, is a matter of interpretation. And I think that's 
kind of one of the interesting things here. I could look at this and say, oh, this is completely different from Clossing. And somebody else could look at it and say, oh, it's not that different from Clossing. And, and I guess uh, and in, in the end, we just look at the data and we see what it says. And then people draw conclusions based on what they think. Um, Pete, I'm happy to take whatever questions people might have. Absolutely. Um, so I see a hand. So uh, Ed's got a question. Ed Maydew has a question. Hey, Scott, good to see you here in Norway. <laughs> Uh, I have kind of a broad question. This might be, this is not really even specific to your paper, but you know, if I look at this, this, this model in this paper, the classing model, I understand in your paper, you're, you're, you can't turn five dials at once. You're trying to turn one dial. that looks like where you're going from macro to micro. So you're just adopting this model that was, you know, already used. But if I kind of look in the literature, there's all these different income shifting models that are used. And at least kind of my perception is that is, is a reader, sometimes it's hard for me to tell what the kind of implied counterfactual is or the baseline. And I'm just wondering if you have, uh, agree with that or if you have thoughts on that and what, you know, if I look at this model right here this, in this paper, it, it's not exactly clear to me what the counterfactual is or do you have any, any just any thoughts yeah. on that? Or? Yeah, totally. I mean, I've thought about this a lot. In fact, Kevin and I have a different paper, which uses like a totally different model where we work this out and Others have used both the CompuStat data and then, of course, the Bureau of Van Dyke data. Um, a lot of those models are actually adaptations of models that were created at the macro level first. So the Bureau of Van Dyke stuff that uses log of income on log of labor and capital is an adaptation of Heinz and Rice, which was the macro model first. Um, the counterfactual really, I think what Clossing is assuming, and so what we assume is that essentially, um, when you look at that elasticity, she's just going to say, oh, the, the rate is what the effective tax rate is. So say 20% foreign, but it should have been 30. And if it had been 30, how much income would have been recorded versus how much income is recorded? And it's just all implied in that elasticity. That's why the elasticity turns out to be super important because as that thing changes, everything else changes. But, it, but there's no exogenous variation in the sense that you have like some awesome shock or something like that. It's just sort of like all assumed that these rates are exogenous enough for that elasticity to capture the counterfactual. Um, I'm not sure that's the best way, by the way, but it just, that's what they're doing. And so we did as close to what they did in this paper as we could at the micro level. Thanks, Scott. Um, Christina has her hand up, Christina Llewellyn. Awesome. Well, thanks, Scott and, and Robert and uh, Kevin. It was a super interesting paper. And I think it's really good to think about, um, you know, just we generally think, I think a lot of times that income shifting is like super pervasive. So taking, taking a step back from that is, is super interesting. So just a couple of thoughts that I had. Um, and I think maybe Johannes kind of hit on some of these from a methodological standpoint. I was wondering if you could even broaden the contribution a little bit as you go forward by kind of saying, okay, let's think about income shifting studies and what are the implications of this for those studies? You know, do we need to do, you know, quantile regression or do we need to figure out some other way to make sure that a few firms aren't driving the results? So I think, um, you know, possibly going in that direction might be something you want to think about. I think it kind of probably depends on whether you're going to target more of an econ journal, whereas you might not necessarily want to do that as much or an accounting type journal that I think you would definitely want to think more about that. And then I was looking at your list of firms and just kind of out of curiosity, pulled up their 10Ks and the tax footnotes just to kind of see what they look like. And when you look at Apple, you know, they have a lot of U.S. income and, you know, their most of their tax paid is, is more in the U.S. versus foreign. So um, I think the magnitude, even though like a large, large percentage of the foreign seems to be shifted to tax havens the just like the the general magnitude is smaller there versus like Abby V, you know, they they had uh, in the years I looked at a loss, a domestic loss, and then almost all of their income is concentrated in foreign. So I was thinking maybe um, it could be interesting to kind of look at the tax footnotes. And but, I mean, both the, the interesting thing about both of these firms is that their effective tax rates um, aren't that aren't super low. So just kind of thinking about what's going on there and, you know, if you could use that, you know, tax footnote data, I think it's available in auto analytics, at least probably for some firms in your sample to kind of even figure out what's going on within these large firms that seem to be shifting a lot of income could be super interesting. 
Yeah, I mean, that last point is a, is a good one. Actually, there's a whole middle section of the paper which I didn't present, and it's not very well developed really, but where we do essentially look at what we call foreign tax deficits, but essentially what there is foreign effective tax rates scaled up to be income numbers as opposed to rates. Um, but yeah, I mean, I agree. One of the things we should do is correlate all of this stuff with the other things that we already know, including effective tax rates, both foreign and worldwide. So there's, there's lots to be done there. Yeah, thanks, Christina. Thanks, Christina. If others have uh, questions, you can use the raise hand feature or put your questions in the chat box. Um, I'm not sure if, um, Scott, if you wanted to address Floris's question, maybe, maybe you have already in a way in terms of uh, wouldn't weighting by, by, um, by size make sense if you're thinking about lost revenue? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's, I, I really appreciate that point and, and Johannes made it too. And I've talked to my colleagues about it, you know, sitting out here at lunch. Is it wrong to have it weighted? Is it a feature or is it a bug? And I think the answer is it depends exactly on what you're trying to accomplish. So um, the revenue loss to countries is probably more accurately represented by the weighted, weighted value. And so that's completely accurate. And if that's what you care about, that's the thing. But how you might address that revenue loss, in the end, we apply policies firm by firm, not to the whole economy, right? They go firm by firm by firm. And if all of the revenue loss is coming from 10 firms and we apply a policy that hits the other, you know, 1900 firms and damages their ability to operate efficiently, the consequences of that policy could like the, 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 the cure might be worse than the disease. And so it really depends on the question you're asking. And all we're trying to point out is you should think about this because one size does not fit all. That's the point. So I think Johannes made that point too. And I, and I agree, like in some situations, absolutely the weighted number is the correct number. So all these digital services taxes are exactly to the point. That, yeah, interestingly enough, I mean, as, as much as like the US has kind of complained about those, if you believe what we're showing here, it's, it might actually be like the right thing to do. Yeah. Great, we have a question from uh, Stephen Glazer. Uh, yeah, Scott. So um, just on, on the weighting, I think I think your point is well taken, but it would still be interesting to see the results if you did did weight by revenue, right? I think I think everyone's kind of curious uh, what that would look like. Um, and then just kind of just at a high level, as you, as you went through the data and, and from your knowledge of the literature, why aren't the other firms shifting out? I mean, when you think about it. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the interesting thing is we all sit around and read articles about Apple and Google, and it sounds so easy to shift income. But the reality is most firms are actually transferring and moving around real products and real goods and services. And there's only so much income shifting that you can do. And so if you just look at their foreign effective tax rates, for example, the average firm, and I'm not talking about the macro estimates, I'm talking about the firm by firm estimates, the typical firm is paying like 20 to 25 percent foreign effective tax rate, which implies that a lot of its earnings just get stuck in countries with high tax rates. Mm -hmm. and it's because they don't have entirely intangible based goods and services or they have things where there's comparables and the governments have rules to stop those things from happening. And it, and it works often. Yeah, I, I mean, that makes a lot of sense, but it did seem like there were some companies on that list like Coca-Cola and Pepsi stuck, stuck out. I guess I guess their brand names are just that valuable or something. But it it does seem like there should be more more companies on the list. To me, I mean, maybe you don't don't feel that way. What what do you think about it? Oh, I mean, part of the reason you get on the list is because you're huge. Okay, so it's it's a, it's a function of both size and your ability to do this. And so you might have also seen Exxon on there. I'm not really sure Exxon belongs on there, but when you apply a sort of a, these elasticities across all types of industries, you end up with an Exxon on there where probably they shouldn't belong there. And if you did what Christina suggested and you went firm by firm at the tax footnote and looked just at like effective tax rates, you would come up with a slightly different list, although we do that in the paper and it's not as different as one might think. So um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a combination of many factors. And I guess I'm not that surprised because it really is about size and about intangibility. And if you think about size and intangibility in that intersection, you end up with a pretty small list of firms. Just a small comment on waiting by size and the regressions or waiting by revenue. 
Um, I'm not sure this is a solution to, to the problem because normally you should wait inversely to the variants or something like that. There's a, there are good papers that uh, sort of go on why we should wait regressions. And I don't think that's the issue here that we expect the variants to be inversely related to size. So it's really the, the, the size component must come out of the simulation, not out of the weighting of the regression. Um, or we have to find something exogenous to separate, uh, to, to make a sample split or something like that. Yeah, I appreciate that, Johannes. I think, I think you're dead on, yeah. So you you didn't wait by, by size in the regressions. I, it was just, I <laughs> thought it was one of the comments now. That's correct. We did not do it in the regressions. Yeah, that's correct. Thanks, Scott. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Johannes, for your uh, presentations. Uh, thanks, everybody, for the for the Q and A.